Well, first of all, let me thank the organizer of this conference on security of property rights for the invitation and particularly allow me to send a very warm greetings to the members of the Free Market Foundation, which I had the opportunity to meet a few months ago in South Africa. I really keep wonderful memories of your country and of all the person I had the occasion to know. Today, I'll have the opportunity to share this conversation uh, with you is with Maria Corina Machado, the Venezuelan leader that had spoken out loudly, bravely, and really straightforward warning since the beginning of the catastrophic consequences of the weakening of property rights in the country as a part of the imposed socialism of the 21st century. We all remember that session of the legislative power in January 2012, when Maria Corina state expropriation is to steal. That was a moment in which Hugo Chavez used the word expropriation really for property confiscation. Presidente, tenemos ocho horas ¿Ocho? escuchando Ajá. usted describir un país muy distante del que estamos sintiendo todas las mujeres y las madres venezolanas. Allí hemos llegado al extremo. Hemos llegado por favor, por favor. al extremo de escuchar que hay aumento en la producción de leche, cuando usted sabe que hoy en día hay mujeres, madres, que asisten a bodegas, a automercados y han llegado a, a la fuerza por un litro de leche porque no tienen que llevar a sus casas. Este es el momento de darle respuestas al país, a las más de 180 mil madres y mujeres que en estos 13 años han perdido a sus hijos, a sus esposos, a sus padres, y a los cuales no se les ha hecho justicia. Esto es lo que queríamos escuchar, la Venezuela decente, y la que no quiere definitivamente avanzar hacia el comunismo. Quiere respeto a la propiedad y queremos una Venezuela de, de solidaridad, una Venezuela de justicia, una Venezuela de superación. Por favor. ¿Cómo puede usted hablar de que respeta al sector privado en Venezuela cuando se ha dedicado a expropiar, que es robar? Cuando se ha dedicado robar. a insultar, sí, las propiedades de empresarios, comerciantes, hasta pequeños posadas a quienes ni siquiera se le han resarcido su propiedad. Dígale la verdad, Venezuela. Aquí hay una Venezuela decente que quiere una transformación profunda y que es el momento de enfrentar con seriedad y con responsabilidad este desafío histórico que tenemos por delante. El tiempo se les acabó. Es el momento de una nueva Venezuela. Maria Corina Machado is one of the most important opposition leaders in Venezuela. She is a former member of the National Assembly, the Venezuelan Legislative Power, National Coordination, Coordinator of the Liberal Party, Vente Venezuela, co-founder of the Election Monitoring Association, SUMATE, and one of the lead organizers of the 2014 and 2017 freedom protests in the street of Venezuela. Machado has a degree in industrial engineering from Andres Bello Catholic University and a master degree in finance from the Institute of Advanced Studies in Administration. She ran for president in 2012. Machado coordinates Soy Venezuela, the national alliance of political movements, civil organizations and citizens that aims to bring back democracy, defeating the tyranny in Venezuela. Hi, Maria Corina, this is a great occasion. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to share with you um, our, our lessons as a, as a Venezuelan society uh, in the face of, of fighting against uh, a regime that, that wanted to, to turn down uh, a society based on, on freedom and democracy. And, uh, and well, what, what's ahead of us and, and what can the world, as I said, learn uh, from our experience? Thank you very much. Maria Corina, during the last five years, Venezuelan economy has shrunk almost to half. The depression is worse than that of the 20s, worse to the recently experienced by Greece and to any suffered by countries of South America. These levels of deterioration have only been seen in wars or in the economies of transition. Venezuela suffers the first digital hyperinflation far surpassed those experienced by Latin American countries and is dangerous getting close to that of Zimbabwe. 
Debt levels are more than five times the annual exports of the country, while the Republic and PDVSA, the state-owned company, accumulate this year more than $5 billion in outstanding payment to bondholders. Today, the Venezuelan exodus is a world news, being the channel of transmission of this crisis. As a Venezuelan leader, please explain us how Venezuela, a country that during the 20th century was an example of democracy and an example of economic success, got to this, to this, situation, to this situation, which were those main drivers that guided to the collapse? That's a, that's a tough question to answer and, and to answer from Venezuela because uh, over 30 million Venezuelans uh, cannot uh, believe how, how horrible, how terrible this uh, destruction, devastation uh, that has taken place has uh, have come to, to, to where we are right now. Believe me, there are no indicators, no numbers, not even uh, images that can convey the degree of pain and suffering Venezuelan society is going through and the degree of destruction, not only from economic perspective, but from an institutional, cultural, social uh, that, that has been taking place. Um, as, as, as you said, Venezuela was a vibrant economy. And uh, when Hugo Chavez came to power, uh, the, the price of oil was around seven to eight dollars. It, it jumped up to over $150. So it is the longest and biggest oil boom in our history. And as, as you see other oil producer countries um, that have you know, moved ahead in their economy, in their reserves, in the, the quality of life of their population, Venezuela has moved severely the other way. So, so what, what is behind this? And what are, as you say, the drivers or, or the practices that, that have produced such a catas catastrophe? I, I'd, I, I would like to recount how we got here. First of all, it, it was um, a well-designed project with ideological uh, supports that clearly are linked to communism and militarism, but that presented itself as a popular uh, and, and, let's say, uh, engaging with, uh, with the popular and poor, poor sectors of society, applying populism at, at its best. It had a lot of resources, it got support from uh, the media sector and uh, private sectors at the moment, and used all Venezuelan uh, resources coming from oil to create a system of distribution and dependence. So populism that was hiding a project that wanted to um, take control of Venezuelan institutions, destroy the rule of law, uh, create dependence on the regime on the, or, or the government at that moment, and uh, exacerbating um, the centralism and aesthetism that was uh, still in place in a, in a Venezuelan system that at that time lacked what we believed was an even more open market. So uh, it presented itself through populism as a regime that wanted to, to, to create fair conditions for the poor, but that was hiding a clear intention to take control uh, of power, of institutions, and systematically destroying every sector or business that would create wealth and independence for Venezuelan society. Allow me to insist defining the organizing forces of this multidimensional crisis of Venezuela. Is it the result of the rentier failed state combined with cronyism and incapacity? Or is it a looting socialist communist model imposed? Or is it the result of an outlaw state which is part of an illegal global network? That is a crucial 
crucial question because that's at the bottom line if we do not have the correct uh, evaluation of the true nature of what we are dealing facing with. dealing with we won't be able to to overcome it in Venezuela right now what we've got is a criminal state a criminal state we cannot talk about even dictatorship anymore it is not even a crisis even though as you have mentioned and 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 described it, it's horrible from a human institutional or economic perspective but actually what what's happening in Venezuela it's a conflict it is an internal it's not an internal conflict it's not a dispute among Venezuelans it is a transnational conflict which nature is not politic it is criminal what I'm saying is Venezuelan territory has been taken over by um, organized crime networks that come from all over the world and that have found a sanctuary because the Venezuelan regime had decided to create liaisons of different nature with the Colombian guerrilla that has taken over 60% of Venezuelan territory with the drug trafficking cartels from Mexico, from Colombia and elsewhere, from networks that um, traffic with minerals, gold, diamond, coltan and so on, and even with extreme terrorist groups that finance themselves from illegal activities that take place in Venezuela. This is well known by the intelligence agencies of the world, Europe, America, and so on. And what is astonishing to us is how they were, I mean, the international community that was aware of what state was happening in Venezuela, were indifferent and did not act on time. The, the thousands of murders that take place in Venezuela annually, over 30,000 murders that take place in Venezuela, the hundreds and thousands of children that die because of hunger, lack of medicines or attention, could have been avoided. These lives could have been saved if this had been assumed as a uh, co-responsibility between us Venezuelans that were fighting this tyranny almost alone and the international community that just now has understand the threat, real and present threat, that this criminal state in the Western Hemisphere represents not only for the countries in our, in our continent, but also for the rest of the democratic world. Some Latin American presidents and ex-presidents, the member of the Group of Lima, leaders as Luis Almagro, the, sec the General Secretary of the Organization of the American States, and many other leaders in the world has denounced the situation recently in Venezuela. Also, in an attempt to stop the violation of human rights, the United States and the European Union had signed and extended sanctions targeting some Venezuelan government officials and banning their citizens from dealing with entity and people with corrupt transactions with Venezuela. Just this week, you sent a communication to the presidents of China and Russia, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin respectively, describing the Venezuelan situation as a transnational conflict of criminal order and calling them to act in favor of democracy and Venezuelan citizens. I want you to dig in in the global nature of the problem, why it's not contained in national Venezuelan borders, which are the risk of not dealing with it rapidly, and which are the actions that you will be pleased and needed to be taken by world countries and world leaders to deal with this problem and to restore democracy in Venezuela? Well, that's a, that's a critical issue because certainly geopolitical issues are uh, involved in the Venezuelan conflict right now. Uh, as you mentioned, 
Russia and China had been financing this regime, the Maduro regime and, and former Chavez regime, uh, with billions of dollars. And they have uh, important interest not only in the old sector in Venezuela. Uh, at the same time, there are other countries in Europe that in the past have been selling um, arms uh, and arms uh, that some of them were, have been used for repression ag against our population in recent years. And at the same time, more and more, it's evident the corruption network that the Chavez and now the Maduro regime have been putting in place with other um, um, presidents and governments, not only in Venezuela and the, uh, in, in South America and the Caribbean, but also in Europe, financing different political groups with similar ideological views. So at the same time, as I mentioned before, the fact that more and more is evident that the, um, the, the biggest proportion of drug that is reaching uh, Europe is coming through Venezuela, a good part of it going through Africa. And as I said, uh, groups such as Hezbollah um, are um, have ties with the Venezuelan regime and get financing from these narco traffic uh, illegal activities. So it is evident that there are many interests involved in, in, in the, the events that finally take place in Venezuela. Uh, and I would say another thing that, that uh, uh, the, 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 the region has assumed that this system cannot be content in our frontiers and that they certainly expect and are willing to export their criminal activities and destabilization efforts to other countries in South America, Central America and the Caribbean. So it's evident that it is a, a, a true problem for the world and what we believe right now is that it is it is our need and our duty to make it clear to uh, governments such as the Russian and the Chinese that it is in their best interest to move ahead as fast as possible in an orderly, as much as it is, it is possible, transition to democracy and freedom. Uh, it's not easy because this regime, because of its criminal nature, is not allowing uh, that through, um, let's say, regular means such as elections or dialogues, uh, reforms will be done and they will accept that over 90% of our population and, and, and the whole democratic uh, world is, uh, is against of them. But uh, it is clear that, the, uh, that applying um, in a coordinated manner pressure from abroad and pressure from inside, such as we are doing, will reach a point in which the cost for Maduro and the regime to stay in power will be higher than the cost to leave. That means that we need to put in place much more actions, effective actions, uh, and to isolate completely Maduro and his cronies. Uh, that means stopping absolutely uh, their illegal financing, part of it comes from the illegal uh, sale and, and, and commercialization of gold and certainly drug trafficking. Uh, another uh, way to do it is to create these, um, let's say, tensions among the mafia groups and in that direction the, the sanctions that have been put in place both by the EU the EU and the United States are, are very effective. Okay, let's move a little from the international to a more domestic analysis. The deterioration of the purchasing power of the Venezuelan citizens, the increase of poverty, makes the social dimension a foreground alert. How is the Venezuelan society dealing with this distorted environment? Uh, is there any hope to to the society to overcome this problem, what should be done? Look, I, I spend my life traveling around our country. You know that. I have been forbidden to, to leave, uh, to travel abroad almost five years ago. That's why I'm not 
physically with you today in South Africa. Uh, in South Africa. And I, I'm not even allowed to buy a local plane ticket to move from one point to another point in Venezuela. I have to do it by car and, and you know that, how, that we are strictly followed by the police and the military. They actually, they are outside our office right now. They stand by my house every day and they follow us. So it's, 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 it's a situation that is getting harder every day that goes by and it's certainly more and more dangerous because the regime knows that the Venezuelan people have decided to, to stop this. And, and even though it's a huge risk for, for an individual, for family, there's no other option but to save Venezuela. And that means understanding that this profound suffering that has been tearing away families, there's, I don't think there's one family in Venezuela that remains complete. together or complete today not only because of murders and violence, but because this migration has been forced by the system uh, to get rid, to get rid of people that are prepared, that have properties, that are, that are determined to, to live in a free society where you know, their, their uh, dreams and aspirations can be um, developed. Um, Nonetheless, even though the, 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 this side of, of the human you know, conflict and, and suffering is so dramatic, um, imagine what it means for a family of five to live with one dollar uh, a month as, as income or, uh, or in, the, in, the, in, in the better uh, paid uh, situations, five to ten. I mean, this is something that is beyond survival. And that explains why so many young people are simply running away to, to save their lives. Right now, it's, it's considered the second biggest migration in the world right now. We're talking about three million Venezuelans that have left out of a population of little over 30 million, it's over 10%. But something that could, could grow and, and double or, or, or even raise to, 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 to 8 or, or 10 million if the system stays in power and things keep on deteriorating and accelerating as, as it's taking place right now. That's one side, Sari. That's the, the horrendous, catastrophic side of an intentionally done disaster. But the other side, which is the one I makes me feel so proud, so proud to be Venezuelan, so proud to be part of our generations, is that I see a society standing still and up. We are not on our knees. Uh, you can see the workers of the factories that have been, as I said, expropriated, but were actually confiscated. And, and they are saying, we want our owners back, uh, the, the, the original the owners original. back, and, and we want to work with them. When you see uh, the, the young students in universities that have been forced to listen to this communist uh, speech and propaganda with all resources that you can imagine in terms of millions and millions of dollars, and, and, and they elaborate how they believe in open markets, in a society in which talent, meritocracy, um, excellence are, are, you know, the goals. I, I feel so proud. I mean, this is a, a society in which this creative energy, it's, it's there. I, I, I share it, I've seen it, uh, and I'm sure that as soon as we manage to produce this regime change, we will see all this flourish and, and the lessons we have learned in terms of what works and what doesn't work, what socialism and communism will 
produce in a society, and on the contrary, what freedom and, and property and, and responsibility and, and institutions can create in terms of wealth is, it makes all the difference. Well, just listening to you, I wanted you to share those lessons. Which are the main lessons Venezuela could share to the world? Which lesson we could extract from this experience? of these years of the 21st century. And also, do you think any of them could inform South African politicians and citizens to meet the challenge imposed with this intention to amend their constitution for to allow for expropriation without compensation? Look, Sari, um, I've heard so many times said with friends and people I know around the world, You know, that that has happened to Venezuela would never happen to us. That would never happen to us. And, you know, for myself, I remember that that's exactly what we said 20 years ago. Exactly. That would never happen to us because Venezuela was a vibrant society with institutions, uh, with resources, with a well-prepared and, and, and educated middle class. And we were close to the United States of America and, and so on. And, and look where we are. So I'd say, first of all, institutions. Uh, there, there need to be strengthened. Uh, there need to have the correct incentives for a society to be wealth, wealthy and have this, the state always uh, serving it, 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 serving the society and not, not otherwise. otherwise. So take care of institutions and be sure that the incentives for uh, you know personal realization, justice, and, and accountability is there. Second, I'd, I'd say that, you know, as the society, the culture for democratic freedom um, and, and, and merit, as I was saying, meritocracy, as I was saying, is crucial. And um, in, in our case, we, we thought it was already there and because we had 40 years of democracy it was there for good and and we took them for granted for absolutely so i i if something we have learned is that freedom has to be conquered every single day and 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 this democratic culture has to be transmitted to our young uh, generations from the first day. And, and finally, I would say, never ever underestimate the, the damage uh, that populism can do to destroy uh, uh, a liberal system uh, and, and a democratic uh, society. And populism is a facade many times for authoritarian regimes and in Venezuela for a criminal state. It has been such a costly lesson, but believe me, it's one we'll never forget. So I have absolute trust that we will overcome this tragedy, that Venezuela will recover, that we will get your support from the international community to To, to rebuild our institutions, to bring back home those who have left, and certainly to make sure this would have been the last tyranny in our history. Thank you, Maria Corina. It has been a pleasure to share your comments with this wonderful audience that I'm sure we are having there in South Africa. And to finish this pleasant conversation, let me insist one thing. Property rights are much more than the right for appropriation of things. That's the reason they are consecrated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, signed in 1948, Article 17, for those who have curiosity. We find robust property rights in the virtuous ecosystem of those prosperous cities and countries. However, just weakening that building block can change and perverse the ecosystem. 
And in that moment, you can turn a very prosperous and rich country in a very poor one. Venezuela has given us really important lesson. We Venezuelans are, have been learning this, this lesson very, very hardly. And we hope everybody uh, in the world will understand that we need freedom and prosperity. And for them, property rights are a building block. Thank you very much. And good morning to everybody. Thank you.